Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and my good friend David Zills is back. How you doing? Hanging in there. I'm here. That, that's that's a lot some days. Like I, I think that, that we should just all stop and appreciate just what it takes to be here some days. <laughs> I feel that <laughs> good. Good for you, man. Uh, we're, we're still going to kick because there's a day. Um, so today um, I want to kind of talk about uh, the scriptures and, and, and why we should trust them. And I want to sort of uh, after talking to you before we started recording, you had a, a great point uh, that, that I think is, is worth sort of diving into. Um, in confirmation, we learn that scripture is the word of God because scripture says it is the word of God which is sort of like saying I am Batman because I, I say that I am Batman. Like it, it, it do you see sort of the, it, it, if you already believe this stuff, then well, if you believe that, that um, the, the word of God is true, then you would hear what the word of God says about itself. But how do we look from the outside in, you, you, you know, am I, am I Batman? Um, anything's possible, man. <laughs> if you believe in yourself, just, just, you know, you can be what you want to be. Oh, you're there's, there's gonna be there's gonna coach. be a new Disney movie. It's gonna be um, Harrison and the power of believing in yourself. Yeah, it's just very different. Literally, the coach just sort of yelled at me to stop playing with the grass and said that you're you're never really gonna be great at this. So just go take up space. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so um, yeah, I like how you started with confirmation because. Um, the way we talk about things is very much catechism based, which isn't bad. It's just, it's great when it comes to the theology, but when it comes to apologetics, it honestly is sometimes counterproductive because the catechism was written by Martin Luther to address concerns of Luther's culture, which are not the concerns of today's culture. And he, his culture did not have the same assumptions, background assumptions that we do. So if he said, the Bible is the word of God, people would be like, yeah, right. That That's that's kind of what we all know. If he said God exists, people would have been like, well, duh, because atheism wasn't <laughs> really an intellectually respectable belief system until like the 1700s. And so there are all these things that he could just assume as starting points and then launch from there. But we can't do that because those starting points are not the cultural assumptions of today. And so we have to kind of back up a few steps and say, wait a minute, like you said, let's look at it from the outside and say, if we don't already believe this is the word of God, then then what do we do? And so, um, you know, the way you typically learn this in Sunday school or confirmation is the Bible is the word of God. It's inspired and inerrant. We'll talk about what those things mean. And then therefore, it, if it says Jesus is the son of God and died for our sins and rose from the dead, then all that's true. To make the case in our cultural context where none of those things is assumed, in fact, it's kind of assumed that those are fairy tales, um, then you have to turn the argument inside out. You say, let's start by saying, you know, the Bible is one ancient book among many. That's clear. We can all have that in common as a starting assumption. And Jesus is one religious founder among many. We can all start with that. Let's look at the source material, not just the New Testament, but the other sources that talk about Jesus that are early and that um, talk about the origin of Christianity. And let's focus on the question, who is Jesus? And then secondary question, did he rise from the dead? And so that's really what we've been focusing on up till now. Jesus was the son of God as a historical conclusion, not a theological conclusion. We started with historical arguments, not a theological presupposition that the Bible is the word of God. And we can still say it's based on historical evidence, it makes sense that Jesus was not an ordinary person. There, there. We talked about the uniqueness of Jesus, that if he claimed to be God and fulfilled the attributes of God, and if he rose from the dead, then that sets him apart from every other religious and philosophical thinker. And so it means we should probably pay attention to what he says. And so instead of doing the Sunday school route where, well, the Bible is true, step one, therefore, all these things are true about Jesus. Step two, you kind of have to turn it inside out and say, as a matter of historical record, using the same assumptions that everybody has in our culture, we can actually make a case that Jesus is the son of God and rose from the dead and is unique. Step one, we flip them. 
And then step two, we have to say, if Jesus was God, then we should believe about scripture, what he believed about scripture. And so um, that's important um, because we'll look at this. We may have time today, maybe not. But when you look at the Jesus view of the scriptures that his Jewish culture assumed, he had a very high view. He thought, yeah, these things are true down to the letter. They will be fulfilled in their entirety. He based theological arguments on individual words and tenses of words in the Hebrew Jewish scriptures. And so Jesus had a very high view that, yeah, this isn't just some book, um, but the people that it records really lived. He talks about um, Adam and Eve, Noah, Lot, Abraham, Jonah. He talks about all these people like they're real people. And he bases arguments on specific words. And so he there's this sense in which Jesus had this view that, yes, yeah, scripture really did come from God to the word. And so we can trust it. Now, that doesn't work with the New Testament because it wasn't written at the time of Jesus. There weren't 27 books that Jesus could say, yeah, those are also the inspired word of God. And so we'll have to take another episode to say, how do you think about books that were written after Jesus ministry and and you can still make a case but it's it's um it's not as simple as for the old testament but yeah you have to turn it inside out and say let's just look at history the way any historian word would christian or otherwise and let's look at who Jesus is if Jesus is god in a unique way that nobody else is then we should believe about scripture what he believes and then you go from Jesus to scripture rather than going from scripture to Jesus and this is a place where um, the history doesn't necessarily like go against the theology, but th this way of sort of approaching the, the veracity of the scriptures, whether or not the Bible is true, is actually it's it's supported the way that Lutherans actually think uh, theologically. So the the Baptists uh, are about the only other real sort of like honest to goodness. I believe the whole of the scriptures denomination left. You you can say you're a Methodist and you you really believe it, this, that, and the other. And that's good. But um when you just start with the Bible, that's not necessarily the Lutheran approach. Lutherans start with Lutherans start with Jesus. Um, even in so far as no one comes to the Father except through me. And so we, we better start with him and not not a book about him. Uh, even in John chapter one, when he claims not just uh to to uh speak words, but to be the word, uh we we start then with with uh Paul's claim that that if Christ has not been risen from the dead, our faith is in vain. If Jesus Jesus, though, is risen from the dead. Where can we learn about Jesus? A and what does he say about this? And then when we start to look, you're exactly right at both the Old and the New Testament and, and where these things start to come together. Um, we can we can very much conclude that the scriptures are trustworthy uh, and, and ought to be believed because they are the word of God. Um, but at, at the same time, uh, we don't start with the book. We, we start with the Lord. Yeah, I think there are a couple um, threads I'd like to pull on there. One is... Um... That there's this sense, like, what does inspiration mean? Mm -hmm. So there's there are two extremes that you can think of for inspiration, and neither of them, I think, is the right view of the Christian scriptures. One is to say the scriptures are inspired the way Beethoven or Shakespeare was inspired when they wrote some great work of art. And we don't really mean that there is anything divine or even supernatural. We just meant, in some is... sense, they, they, they had a streak of genius and... Mm -hmm had this great idea you that's not what we're so far as to say like no human being could have come up with this on their own god clearly sort of helped this along it, it's brilliant yeah yeah so so we're, we don't mean that because that wouldn't set the bible apart from any other great work of art now there is um another sense on the other extreme that some religions take but not christianity um which is that it's it's the idea of dictation so in other words, God said, I want you to write down these exact words, and the human author was a robot who is just not thinking and just writing stuff down. Now, there are cases where we do see that in Scripture. We think of like Moses and the tablets or maybe some of the prophets where God appears to a prophet and says, go tell Israel, thus says the yes. Lord, quote, and then the prophet says that quote verbatim. And so there is some dictation but there's a lot of other stuff think about the historical books you know when the gospel writers wrote about the life of jesus it's not that some golden plates came down from heaven and they said oh my goodness there was this guy named jesus i didn't know that oh wow he was born from mary in bethlehem i should write this down no they knew this stuff because they had lived it it was their experience mm -hmm. um so like um 
The Book of Mormon is more the dictation. There were literally golden plates that revealed things that were not known any other way. Um, the, the Quran, the, the Quran is that way. So the Quran, um, there was a voice that told Muhammad recite, and Muhammad literally recited what he was told is, is, is how the story goes. Um, but that's not what we're talking about with scripture. And so there's this sense where the human authors were exercising their own thought, but yet the words were constrained by the Holy Spirit to be exactly what God wanted written. And so I've often wondered, how does that even work? And as I've researched it, I've realized that it's not something that's really specified. Um, you know, they... I don't think when we talk about inspiration, we can talk about the fact of inspiration, whereas the exact psychological mechanism is more of a mystery, which kind of makes sense. We're talking about mysterious things here. Um, so let's focus on the fact of inspiration, which is, yes, there was a human author, but I, I have one physics professor say there's a divine co-author. The Holy Spirit was working within their thinking and wrestling with the words so that what was written is exactly what God wanted to be written. Um, so, so that's the first thing you said there is that, you know, these things are not just revealed from heaven. And we start with the book, we start with the person of Jesus and the book is there in its testimony to who Jesus was and also what God has been doing throughout history leading up to Jesus. Um, the second thing I don't remember, but hopefully it'll come back to me. So I, I, I don't remember either, and I was the one who said it, so I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> there, there's something to that kind of approach to inspiration, though. I mean, it, it's actually something that that our Lord demonstrates throughout the scriptures. You have uh, uh, the high priest Caiaphas uh, that we just dealt with uh, last week in Holy Week, where um, he he and he was inspired to say, "It is better that one man should die for the sake of the people," and and he meant every bit in his heart. You know, let's let's just like off this guy. Um, it'll it'll be good. Uh, but the Lord was like, "No, that's that's actually the gospel," and and all the Christians are like. No, I, I, I think he's right. Um, you, you have then when you start to deal with the scriptures, and, and I know we'll sort of talk about this in the future, but like, I love watching uh, John hate Peter all throughout his gospel. We just had the, the Eastern narrative where like John just sort of needs to be sure that everybody knows he is the apostle that Jesus loved, not Peter, and that he can run faster. Um, <laughs> like there, there are these places where like, I, I am convinced that the Lord Almighty uh, ascended into heaven, like rolls his eyes, even as he uses us sinners to, to preach to each other. Um, but if if he wants this thing said, it, it's going to get said, even behind the personality and, and preferences and, and and things like that uh, of the the apostles and the prophets. Yeah, and one thing that can't be excluded as a mechanism of inspiration is that the person just sat there and thought about it mm -hmm. and used their mind to say, "How do I make sense of this stuff?" So, when you look at Paul's letters, you can see that his later letters are more theologically mature. Um, it could be because he had more time by talking about it to in preaching it, and then his ideas came together. That's not inconsistent with the idea that the spirit was behind that, and that Romans as a later letter is the most theologically mature because he had the most time to try out how to explain it different ways. Um, it's kind of it's not it's not a it's not like this in terms of something you would put in a creed the the dual nature of Jesus fully human and fully divine, but there's the sense in which there's this aspect of scripture where there's a there's a fully human author but the words are still exactly what Jesus what God wanted to be said. I remember the second thing I wanted to say where which is where you say we start with Jesus and we don't start with the book. Um, and th there's some nuance in what I'm going to say, so I want to make sure it's not misunderstood. But when it comes to saving faith, I don't see Scripture saying that believing in the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture is required for saving faith. It's very important. So I don't want to be misunderstood that it's not important. That's not an excuse not to investigate it and to wrestle with the issue. Um, it's so important that the LCMS literally had a split over this 50 years ago. And a lot of the cultural trauma of that is still in the synod today and the way people talk about um, theological issues. Um, but I say that as encouragement because I was at a stage where I was worried when I was wrestling with questions that I'm not sure if all of these, maybe, what about Paul? He wasn't 
one of Jesus' disciples, and Jesus didn't endorse his letters because they weren't written during Jesus' lifetime. So if we're going to base a bunch of theology on Paul, then can I be saved if I'm not sure about this? And, and two things are true. One, the evidence for Jesus being God and his death and resurrection, the deity, death, and resurrection, those that's what saving faith is. And the evidence for those things does not depend on scripture being inspired. Well, that, that's everything we've been talking about so far. And then second of all, if you believe those things, scripture says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so you don't have to be anxious that somehow if you're still wrestling with this issue, that somehow eternity is in the balance. The, the deity, death, and resurrection is what salvation is based on. We can know that without assuming scripture is inspired. And if we believe that, that's that's the core of it. Um, so I mean that not as an excuse, again, to say this doesn't matter and we can be sloppy theologically, but I mean that as encouragement that um, the core of the faith does not depend on this, but rather this depends on the core of the faith. Exactly. Kind of like we talked about turning it inside out. And that's why we don't dismiss it, because the, the veracity of the scripture actually matters if Jesus rose from the dead and said, hey, pay attention to everything that these people are saying. Um, I am sending them to talk to you. Um, it, it, it's not that the Bible matters less if, if uh, we, we have a, an apostolic faith rather than, uh, as our creed says, uh, rather than simply saying, if you don't believe every last word in the Bible, you can't be saved. Uh, because we, we, we don't agree, but evangelicals can, can find salvation in, inside of their churches. It, it's dangerous. The devil is given a lot of rope there and, and he uses it. But at the same time, uh, if you believe that the tenets of the, the creed, that's, that's, that's saving faith. That's why we call it an, an apostolic faith. And so if it is then um, that it, 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 it's something that doesn't support Jesus, but Jesus supports it, that's not to dismiss it because Jesus gives it to you in the same way that we don't dismiss baptism because Jesus gives it to you. And it's a, it's a means by which he will do good things for you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I th you hinted at something, which I think is a good point, which is that if if believing in the inspiration of scripture were necessary for salvation, that's kind of a can of worms, because there are a lot of passages where you're like, well, I believe this is true, but what the heck is he trying to say? <laughs> you know, there, there are some passages that are clear, and then there are other ones that scholars have been debating for hundreds of years. And I mean that this is, in one sense, why we have so many denominations is because there are different ways of interpreting. And we are, we're all called to do our due diligence and say what squares with Scripture the best. Um, but at the end of the day, the core of the faith, the thing that unites us as Christians, um, is, is the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's like you said, the creed and the apostolic faith, meaning this is what the eyewitnesses, the apostles of Jesus preached as the core of the faith. And so I think that's very important. But like we said, we do need to talk about this. Um, it may not be the core of the faith, but the thing that bothered me when I was doing apologetics is so many apologetics books, like The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, they stop with Jesus is the son of God who rose from the dead. And then when you do systematic theology, like pick your favorite text um, from seminary, it starts Chemnitz. with... Chemnitz. Yeah, it, okay, okay. So it starts with... Um, the Bible, Scripture is the source and norm of our doctrine. Me, source meaning we start there, and norm meaning standard. Every step along the way, we're checking ourselves against it to make sure we didn't get off course. And so if, if you stop with Jesus as the Son of God on apologetics and then start with the Bible is the Word of God for theology, there's this gap in here that's kind of like, well, wait, how do we get from point A to point B? And so I want to take some time to address that, because if if this is something that you, you think about these things and you kind of wonder, how do I know is this true, then everything we've said so far would give you confidence in who Jesus is and what he's done, but it won't get you to the point where all of the systematic theology that becomes important for how you live the Christian life and how you relate to God, it doesn't get you that far. So we have to close that gap. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's that's reasonable that um, we, we start with Jesus. And if Jesus is risen from the dead, I want to listen to Jesus and I want to think about what Jesus' words are. And, and that's where systematics, that that's where actually thinking about theology starts to come into play. And, and it's also why we do it. Um, I, I think, you know, it's one of those things we get into so many sort of weird little arguments about stuff that happens in the Bible that uh, our, our Lutheran confessions 
don't dismiss, but they say, maybe you're missing the point. Uh, in the formula of Concord, there's something to the extent that all theology is done for the comfort of troubled consciences, that Jesus died and rose to, to save you. And that the reason that we study all of this stuff, the reason that there are commentaries and Bible studies and all of these things are to address the fears and guilt and shames and concerns that, that you have so that you can have comfort of troubled conscience. Um, we, 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 again, we, we go back to, is this, is this true? And can you trust it? And, and what does it mean then? Is, is only sort of after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe to close out, we can real quickly just cover three cha- three passages from the Gospels where, where we can see, catch a glimpse in terms of this question. If Jesus is God, then what did he believe about the scriptures? Keeping in mind that in Jesus' time, the New Testament had not yet been written. And so the scriptures that he would have been referring to would have been what, what Christians call the Old Testament or what the mm-hmm. Jews have as their scriptures. So real quickly, three texts just to make this concrete. Uh, a big one, Matthew 5, 17 to 18, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets, meaning that's a turn of phrase, meaning the, the Jewish scriptures of his day. Jesus says, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill for uh, truly, I say to you until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So he says, not even the smallest marking on a scroll is going to disappear from from the scriptures until everything is fulfilled. Um, so this is kind of an explicit statement that, yeah, down to the smallest stroke of the pen, it's it's there, yes. it's true, we can have confidence in it. Um, real quickly, two more. Um, another one in John 10, Jesus claims to be God. We've talked about that. And the Jews protest and Jesus gets in this uh, hermeneutical argument with them about this scripture from um, where where one of the psalmists says, I said, you are gods. And Jesus, um, basically, I won't get into it because it's complex, but the point is Jesus bases a whole argument on a single word from a psalm, the word gods. And he says, if this word is true, then you should believe what I'm saying. So he's basing a theological argument on a specific word. And lastly, uh, Matthew 22, Jesus famously gets in an argument with the Sadducees who are trying to disprove the general resurrection at the end of time. And they talk about this hypothetical situation where a woman's husband dies. And so the law of Moses requires that her brother, that the, the husband, the dead husband's brother marry her in order to produce offspring so that she can be taken care of. And this, but then he dies before leaving kids and it happens on and on down through seven. And then they kind of ask this trick question, you know, at the end of the, at the general resurrection, whose, whose wife will she be? And it's supposed to be a trick question to kind of be like, gotcha, Jesus, there's no resurrection of the dead, which interestingly enough, the Pharisees are watching and they're in Jesus camp saying there is a resurrection from the dead. And so they like what Jesus has to say, but the point for our um, topic is that Jesus quotes the Old Testament saying where, where God says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of A- Isaac and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus adds commentary. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So his argument is God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I was when they were alive, but I am in some sense, they're still alive. So now he's using the single tense of an individual word to make his case against the the Sadducees. So we have Jesus explicitly saying every mark is going to be fulfilled. You can have confidence in it. And then he demonstrates this in how he argues theological points with, with the Jews. And so if this was Jesus view of scripture that we can have confidence in it down, down to the word, then that gives us confidence that, okay, that we, we can have the same, same um, confidence that this is our view of scripture. Um, so the inerrancy and inspiration are kind of thrown around interchangeably. They're different. Inspiration is what we talked about, that God orchestrated the words to be exactly what he wanted. Inerrancy means an infallibility are related. Basically, they mean there are no errors. Mm-hmm. And inspiration leads to inerrancy because if god said something if these were the words god wanted to be written then unless god is a liar which you know most theology would say he's not 
then if he said it, it's true. And so inerrancy follows from inspiration. And so when we talk about the New Testament, we'll talk about the the idea that these words were words that were given by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, if the Holy Spirit wanted these things to be true, wanted to be said, then he meant that they were true. And so inspiration and inerrancy are not the same, but they're very closely related. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think we sort of did pretty good for our time today. We're going to have to tackle the New Testament next time, though, aren't we? Yep. That's a fun one. That sounds like a plan. David, okay, thanks so much good. for hanging out. All right. Thanks, Harrison. Have a good one. You too.